Good evening, I'm Lane Hartzell, Soul Global Study Group, and I'm here tonight with Dr. Donald McGlurkin. Uh, he is with the Post Growth Institute and also with the uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Donnie, welcome. Good to see you again. Thanks, Lane. Good to see you too. I'm going to focus in on, he on the uh, video camera here with you. Um, I just want to kind of get you on here to talk about some of your uh, past work, recent work, and what you're up to these days. And the first question I had mentioned to you earlier was how did you get involved with social work and the community development? So let's start there and then go to the more technical stuff. I grew up uh, in a wealthy family, but one that was very asset rich and cash poor. So we never quite had the kind of money that went um, with the, the location, the postcode where we were living. And as a result, um, I got some, some small insights into what it is to struggle uh, along that way. And, and my parents pushed me into an entrepreneurial space um, to do things that would actually be uh, allow me to have some money to go and purchase things for myself, whether it's clothes or, uh, or holidays, etc., that I was looking to, um, to do myself. And so I, I got involved in entrepreneurial activities as a young person and was very interested in, uh, in making money and how to uh, record balance sheets and things like that. And then something happened that I guess is part of, of the change in me towards different community and social innovation futures. And that was one day there were um, various throwouts, in fact, all, all throughout the year, um, places where people would put rubbish out onto the side strip and um, trucks would come past and pick up that stuff and, and put it, take it to the tip, essentially. And one day I found about $15 worth of coins that someone had thrown out. Someone had actually thrown all money. And it was, uh, for me, I, I'd heard that phrase at school, you know, the throwaway society. And, and this sort of seemed like the epitome of that throwaway society. Someone was actually throwing out money. And it was one of those little epiphanies for me about something not being quite right. I mean, I'd, I'd grown up uh, with a sense of, of certain things working and other things breaking down. Um, my families uh, on both sides come from very different political uh, persuasions, so I got to see different sides of stories. And I think when you see different sides of stories, you can't help but develop that critical thinking that then often leads you into community work, into social innovation, to thinking about what is working, what's dysfunctional, and how do we create more functionality and equilibrium in, in our societies. And then I found myself searching for, for ideas and different insights into this. I was always one to get involved with, with different things, be it through school and, and beyond that. And some of the seminal uh, experiences for me were working for three years as a telephone counsellor and working uh, on Sydney streets um, with a food delivery van one night every month um, for a couple of, uh, for three years as well. And there, I kept seeing the same sorts of things across the counselling and the, the work with people on the streets, that you had often very intelligent people who had fallen through the cracks um, or had been forced out through the cracks as a result of social breakdown. Uh, so, for example, gambling, alcohol abuse, um, drug abuse, etc., which had often come as a result, uh, in speaking with these people, had come as a result of a habit or behaviour which was exacerbated through social stresses or individual stresses, not so much the genetic angle. So that was uh, a real eye-opener for me, especially one night when I was talking to a guy uh, who was a lot younger than me, and I asked him his story, and he said, well, I've been nine months in the park up the road. Uh, I got kicked out of university for hacking. Um, you know, I had a, a drug addiction at the time, and my parents kicked me out as well. And it turned out this guy was number one, three years earlier, he was number one at, at one of Sydney's most prestigious private schools. And that to me was like, whoa, what's happening here in a society? I mean, it's bad enough that anyone's on the streets, but it's amazing that someone like that would be on the streets in three years and that we have a society that doesn't even know about that. Um, that to me is quite shocking. And so these are just some of the little things that have, have been... Um, things that I remember in, in my journey towards social innovation and community development. So, so you're, you're saying that there are people that are 
they could, they could be surgeons, they could be lawyers, they could be whatever, uh, that are on the streets simply because the social system is, is uh, not allowing it and not allowing them to have a certain level of essential needs met. In part, yes. I mean, this is where you get into that interesting debate about uh, self-determination and you see this huge divide, particularly in the US, uh, around these issues where people talk about a hand up versus a handout and whether or not it's the system's fault that people are on the streets versus their own upbringings and their own situations and efforts. My take on it is this, that there are certain things that we can do in our communities, in our societies, that give people the best chance to be the kind of person that they can be in terms of their potential. And a lot of that involves uh, connection with creativity. In fact, just today a study got released of a, um, a million people, the uh, world's biggest study into this area, a million people um, with, I think it was looking at uh, creativity and the link with mental illness. And it was showing that there's a strong, stronger correlation than people understood uh, in terms of creativity uh, and, and mental illness. And that's an interesting thing, right, because society usually says, particularly when it comes to schooling, etc., well, if you're exhibiting signs of, of mental illness, etc., you need help. And what this study was actually starting to show is that there are many brilliant aspects uh, that are associated often with that mental illness that then get sidelined because of the stigmas associated with mental illness. And that's, that was my experience through schooling. That if you were different, chances were that you were sidelined, whether that was from your fellow students who, you know, I was someone who was bullied heavily throughout school um, or through to someone who was actually uh, sidelined because of the way the system was set up in terms of the subjects that are taught, in terms of the way the teaching style is. I mean, schools are changing around the world uh, as we speak, but when I was at school, it was still a very didactic method. Uh, someone would stand up the front and instruct uh, it wasn't a participatory style, which for mine has been the approach that I've taken with just about everything I do. And so, yeah, I think lots of people do fall through the cracks. And I don't think schools generally in the West uh, give very many good life skills in terms of coping with the complexity that's associated with complex adaptive systems. Uh, it, it's usually training which sets you up for reductionist thinking. And so often we'll put our finger on something and say that's a problem or that's a solution because that's the way that we've been taught in schools to think. Yet we know in reality that most of the challenges we face in society, whether it's ones around drinking, um, drug use, um, sexual habits, all sorts of things, they're extremely complex. And I think that complexity gets swept out the door because perhaps people think, well, younger people can't deal with that complexity. Well, in fact, in my opinion, that's a real disservice to the wisdom and intelligence that is there if we just plant those seeds. Let me ask you just quickly for a definition of terms so that people that are listening can understand. Uh, what, is, what would you say reductionism is? How do you describe that? I'm not a scholar of uh, the Enlightenment period when that kind of language came out, but my take on it is any time you try to reduce something to a component and say that the component is important by itself. Um, 